Have you heard about this new MMO? It's called The World, and it's the latest craze sweeping Japan. It's not like your other typical MMOs either. It's completely open and sandboxed. You can do whatever you want, be whoever you want, and go wherever you want. It's the ultimate role-playing experience. There's just one issue. There's these rumors. Rumors of people going into comas or ending up hospitalized. I even heard there's someone claiming to be trapped in the game and unable to log off. Sounds crazy, right? This setting is the concept of the 2002 PlayStation 2 exclusive Dot .hack infection, the first in a four-part series of PS2 games centered around people playing and investigating the mysteries of a fictitious popular MMO called The World. Back when I was a kid, I spent a lot of my time in my bedroom playing RPGs on my GameCube and PlayStation 2. I'd play them all day, putting hours upon hours into Final Fantasy, Harvest Moon, Kingdom Hearts, and multiple other games. This was before dipping my toes into Monster Hunter. By the time I was done, it'd be dark outside and our Canadian TV equivalent to Nickelodeon would start broadcasting anime for a few hours. The shows they broadcasted were pretty standard, Dragon Ball Z, Inuyasha, and a few others that didn't really interest me at the time. But one really caught my eye, a show about a character named Tsukasa who was stuck inside an MMO called The World, with no recollection of how they got there. Along with Inuyasha, it was one of the first true examples of isekai to me, a type of genre that is incredibly popular in 2020. This genre and this concept of a television series was something I had never really heard of before, and the art style, music, and atmosphere were so unique to everything typically on TV that I became instantly hooked to the 26 episode series. Isekai is the idea of accidental travel, where characters end up in a world that is unlike their own, usually fantastical in nature, and it dates back all the way to ancient Japanese literature. But it was a popular trope within modern Japanese media dating all the way back to 1983 with the release of Aura Battler Dunbine. The idea of isekai wasn't a term that was widely well known to western audiences at the time, but there was multiple examples of television shows that followed the trope in the 90s like Digimon or Visions of Escaflone, two of my personal favorite series as a child. The escapist nature of the genre makes it very appealing to a lot of daydreaming youths who spend a lot of their time playing video games, in effect me. So, it was no surprise that the concept and atmosphere of Dot Hack Sign grabbed my attention. Dot Hack Sign wasn't your typical isekai experience. It wasn't just about characters entering a fantastical environment, having the time of their lives, going on adventures, and making new friends. No, a lot of that was there, but was deconstructed in the process. A large portion of the anime focused on the darker side of isekai, and what escaping reality and the reasons for doing so might mean to both the central protagonist and those around them in their real life. The idea of the modern MMO The World is, in itself, about escapism, and the show explores what many of these characters Tsukasa runs into or are escaping from, as well as how it's affecting their mentality. And that's all the show had to do. It created this amazing setting full of thought-provoking discussion on escapism, as well as multiple mysteries around the MMO itself and its inner workings. Some of these questions and mysteries were answered, or at least shed light on within the 26 episodes of Sign, but many questions were left unanswered and had a younger version of myself really scratching my head. Fast forward to me on my computer googling whatever I could about Dot .hack and finding out there were not one, not two, not three, but four PlayStation 2 video games centered around the series, with a new trilogy on the way. How had I never heard about this before? I had to have them. I needed them because I needed to know what else happened in this series. I needed to know what was going on in the world, and I had to experience firsthand this setting that I had only been able to watch on TV beforehand. What is Dot .hack, and how did it become one of the most expansive media Media series out there today, with multiple video games, animes, manga, light novels, OVAs, and so on. In this multi-part video series, I'll be going over all four volumes of Dot .hack IMOQ, including Infection, Mutation, Outbreak, and Quarantine, as well as the game's significance and influence on modern series that came out after it. I'm Super Rad, and today I'm here to bring you a brief history of Dot .hack Infection. If you're familiar with Sword Art Online at all, you may be familiar with many fans or detractors of the series calling it a ripoff of Dot .hack, which many may consider a much older series in comparison to Sword Art Online. However, this is incorrect. Sword Art Online happens to have been a novel series before its anime release, and the first novel was published in Japan in 2001, a year before the release of Dot .hack Infection, the first part of the IMOQ tetralogy. Now Infection's development still started in 2000, before the release of Sword Art Online, but the close proximity 
proximity of the two series makes it exceptionally difficult to call one a ripoff over the other. Rather, they were two series that explored the isekai genre within an MMO setting, and that's a subgenre of isekai that has been explored even further with series like Log Horizon. Dot Hack is owned and developed by CyberConnect2, a Japan based development company known for cult classic games like Tales Concerto, as well as the developers of many of the Naruto fighting games released lately. Originally, they were simply known as CyberConnect, but updated the name in 2001 when Hiroshi Matsuyama took over as the company's president. Funny enough, CyberConnect is now an in universe company within the Dot Hack series, known as CyberConnect Corporation, or CC Corporation, and are the company to release the world. Hiroshi was one of the main factors in developing Dot Hack and came up with many ideas and concepts for the series. Out of all the ideas, the main one to stick was the concept of an offline online game. The ability to feel like you're playing some sort of online experience without actually doing so. Matsuyama really liked this idea as it would give young players the ability to experience online without having to worry about monthly fees or internet connections. Do you remember me saying earlier that both the art and atmosphere are what really hooked me when it came to watching Dot Hack Sign? Well, there's a good reason for that. CyberConnect 2 brought on Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, best known as the character designer for Neon Genesis Evangelion, as well as Kazunori Ito, who was the scenario writer for Ghost in the Shell. In a 2003 interview with IGN at E3, Matsuyama mentioned that Dot Hack was to follow the four part structure of traditional comics or manga in Japan, meaning the series was expected to be split into four parts since the beginning of development. To accommodate this, the games would be designed in a way that would allow the players to transfer their save data over from game to game upon completion. This meant players would be able to keep their levels, rare items, and progression with character affection and really feel like they were progressing along with the storyline and characters. This wasn't something you ever really saw within game releases, and the concept was so novel that I knew I had to experience it personally. IMOQ was part of a bigger set of releases known as Project.Hack, which was to be a multimedia series. Project.Hack is considered the first generation generation of releases within the Dot .hack series and consists of games, anime, CD dramas, novels, and manga. I won't be going into all of them, but generally they all relate to one another in some capacity and shed light on the overarching plotline and setting, with the games being the core factor that the other media surround themselves around. Sign was actually out before the first release of IMOQ and was a great introduction into what players could expect from the games in the series. So that's all well and good, we have this huge multimedia series consisting of pretty much any form of media you can think of, but what were the actual games about? What did Dot .hack infection actually bring to the table and what could players do? Well to understand that, we'll first take a look at the world and Dot .hack storyline. So before we get into the main storyline of our protagonist, Kite, let's get into a little backstory about the world and its development. The world was the first MMO to be created since a catastrophic event known as Pluto's Kiss. On December 24th, 2005, every computer connected to the internet crashed simultaneously, leading to countless traffic accidents and disasters around the world. Think Y2K, except real. Except not real, because it, this is a video game. This led to the development of the Ultimate OS, which was the only operating system really used after the previously described events. The World R1 was created for this operating system. The beta version of the game known as Fragment was created by a man named Harold Hauerwick. But due to complications, the beta was stopped early before release. The storyline and general atmosphere of the world was based around an epic poem by web author Emma Wyland, who Harold was infatuated with. Through Emma's death, Harold became obsessed with his project and preserving her work within it. Through both the MMO itself and the creation of an AI girl known as Aura. Now I won't be getting into more of that backstory or Aura too much until later entries in the series, but all you really need to know right now is that the game is based on a poem and there's an AI girl running around within it. The game featured six classes by the time of infection, but this number would grow with the release of expansions seen in other dot .hack media like in the manga series Legend of the Twilight. The classes we care about are Blade Masters who use single hand swords, Heavy Axemen who use two handed axes, Heavy Blades who use great swords, Long Arms who use lances, Twin Blades who dual wield daggers like Kite, and Wave Masters who use staffs to cast magic. Players hang out in areas called root towns, which function as hub areas across multiple servers. For example, players that access the Delta server can explore the root town Makanu, while players that move to the Theta server can visit Dunlorieg. These cities offer multiple functions, but mostly just shops for the player to restock on items before going out into a field to fight monsters. That leads us to the main and arguably most unique mechanic of the world, Chaos Gates. Each hub town holds a Chaos Gate, and players can use these gates to switch servers 
servers or input combinations of special keywords. These combinations of keywords will dictate what type of area the player is going to explore. Generally, the player will be taken to a field they can explore as well as a dungeon they can enter and complete for loot. Some have the fields act as a dungeon themselves, while other areas are completely unique and don't really seem to serve any sort of purpose. We'll get into more details about those ones later. For now, let's take a look at the storyline of Infection specifically, and then we'll go into all of the features that the player can interact with. Dothack IMOQ revolves around the in-game character known as Kite, a twin blade class who is actually an 8th grader invited to play the world by his real-life friend Orca, aka Yasuhiko, who is also a 14-year-old junior high student. Orca spends the majority of his screen time showing Kite the ropes, from how to use chaos gates to how the battle system works, and offers to take him through his first dungeon. Unfortunately, on their way through their first dungeon, Kite and Orca spot the elusive AI girl clad in white known as Aura being chased by a special enemy known as Scathe. Upon reaching the end of the dungeon, Orca and Kite are teleported to a new area where Aura runs into them and offers Orca a special book item that she doesn't want to end up in the hands of whatever has been chasing her. Before he can properly receive the book, Scathe shows up and Aura flees. Orca ends up in a fight against Scathe, which culminates with Scathe performing a special move known as Data Drain. This not only incapacitates Orca, but also puts Yasuhiko into a coma in the real world. Kite manages to unknowingly escape with the book thanks to a notorious hacker within the world known as Helba. Kite finds out about Orca's comatose state and looks to the world for answers. Upon logging in for the first time after the previous events, he runs into a heavy blade user known as Black Rose. Black Rose is another user new to the game but tries to feign experience when she catches Kite staring at her. She offers to take him to a special area she heard about using the keywords Hidden Forbidden Holy Ground, which transport the two to a special area that isn't like the typical fields players explore. Instead, this area is a giant cathedral with a statue of Aura chained up within. On the statue are the names Scaith, Innis, Magus, and multiple others that can't be made out. Wait, wasn't Scaith the being chasing after Aura? Well, let's keep that in mind for the next part of the series. I should also note that Black Rose's motivations for investigating the issues with the world and aiding Kite aren't made clear by this point, but it's insinuated that she also lost someone similar to how Kite lost Orca. It's here that Kite and Black Rose meet Bao Meng of the Azure Sky, a well-known veteran player and friend of Orca's. It's explained later in BBS messages that the duo were the only players to complete a limited time event and receive special titles and rewards for doing so. Bao Meng is chasing a data bug, which is essentially a monster corrupted by a virus, making it invincible. Baomung attempts to fight it to no avail and Aura soon contacts Kite, telling him to use the book he received earlier. Doing so places a special bracelet on Kite's wrist and overwrites his character data, changing the color of his character's clothing as well as placing multiple symbols on them. This bracelet allows Kite to use the same ability as Scathe, Data Drain, which allows him to turn these virus-infected monsters back into their normal counterparts, meaning they can be properly defeated. Baomung initially believes Kite to be a hacker and the reason for everything that's been going on lately, but but soon begins to be less suspicious once finding out that Kite is a friend of Orca's. You don't see much more of Baomung after this point until future games. After these events, the investigation continues, but during a trip to Makanu, Kite meets the Wavemaster Elk and the Blademaster Mia. However, Mia is in the form of a humanoid cat creature with long ears, which is not a possible character creation option within the game, leading people to believe that she must be some sort of hacker. This also doesn't get brought up much until later games in the series. Mia can see Kite's bracelet, which is invisible to everyone else, including Kite, and she has him meet her in a dungeon so she can see him use Data Drain firsthand. After this, she teaches him about gate hacking, which I'll go into more detail about later. However, for clarity, it allows previously locked off field areas to be accessible to everyone once unlocked by Kite. Kite then goes on to meet Mistral and Pyros, two other characters he must meet throughout the storyline, as well as three optional characters I'll mention later. Helba, the notorious hacker that saved Kite, begins sending him emails to help explain his powers and guide him along the way to figuring out what happened to Orca. Through messages on the BBS and general snooping, Kite and Black Rose enter a dungeon with a dead end that transports them to a room that is completely white, and seems to be the bedroom of someone. It's heavily implied through a note left by Harold that this was Aura's room. Later, they find a similar room that looks like it's been torn apart. Nothing really comes out of this, and Kite and Black Rose continue their investigation, mostly talking to people that knew Orca. It it becomes clear, however, that whoever is running the world doesn't want people finding out about these issues and continues to delete conversations off of the BBS which pertain to such topics. Kite even gets a threatening email from an anonymous source telling him to stop searching, or else. After multiple dead ends, the group finally stumble across a set of keywords that should lead to the location of Scathe, thanks to Helba's help. 
Kite and Black Rose enter, make their way through the dungeon, and come face to face with Scathe, who has managed to capture Aura. They arrive just in time to see Aura split apart into multiple pieces and shot off into different directions. The team fights and defeats Scathe, using Kite's power of Data Drain, but soon after large structures begin to appear from the ground. Kite looks up to see a giant horrific beast in the sky known as Kubia. With Scathe gone and Kubia now here, the characters as well as the player are left unsure of where this will lead, with the story continuing in part 2 of the series, Dot Hack Mutation. Outside of the story, let's take a look at some of the mechanics introduced and design decisions made, starting with the offline online experience. As I mentioned earlier, the team behind .hack wanted to make an offline game that felt as if it was online in order to help give players who couldn't easily access an internet connection or the ability to pay monthly fees the chance to try out what is essentially a pseudo MMO. One of the first things the player will experience is the Ultimate OS Desktop. Here they can do things you'd expect from a typical PC like changing your desktop background, browsing the web for news, or checking your emails. Characters close to Kite will often send him affection emails which are unlocked as the player builds up their party members affection through bringing them along for dungeon crawling or gifting them items. These emails can actually be responded to by Kite and the player with specific responses offering better affection values and leading to more character development for Kite's party overall. For gameplay purposes, the player can even save their game data here or from a specific attendant within the world. Finally, the world can be accessed from the desktop. When the player selects it, they're brought to a home page for the game where they can either log in or check the BBS. BBS stands for Bulletin Board System and was a type of older dedicated forum used by individuals to communicate online in a public environment. As the player progresses through .hack, there will be plenty of updates to the BBS with the new threads of topics as well as people replying over time. Kite will even write his own post at some point during the storyline. These posts can be anything from players discussing topics that pertain to the backstory of the game, to individuals offering special keywords to advance the story or offer side content for the player to explore. You can tell that even before logging into the MMO itself, the player is made to feel like they are using a computer and interacting with other individuals through an online space. But what can they do in the game itself? Well, let me show you. The main place that the player will be hanging out is within each server's root town. I mentioned it earlier, but the Delta server is the first and only server the player will have access to at the start of the game and has players congregate within Makanu. Makanu contains multiple shops, mostly for entry level equipment, items, and spell scrolls, as well as the location to save their game and a location to store their items. Shops aren't the only thing in the towns. Kai can also interact with multiple other player characters that are running around. By interacting with these characters, Kai can talk to or trade with them. Trading can sometimes offer items that are impossible to get at certain points in the game and give the player an edge when it comes to grinding areas or progressing in the story. Later on, the players are able to enter Theta Server, which also has its own unique root town known as Dunlory Egg. The Theta Server root town works exactly like Makanu, but has one additional feature, the inclusion of Grunties. Grunties are special creatures within the world that the player can talk to and interact with. They can even feed special food they find out on the field to their own Grunty and watch it grow. Oh, mon ami, thank you! I've become a fine gentleman because of you! To thank you for all your loving care, I want you to have this, mon ami! Use this in the field to call me, mon ami. I'll repay my debt to you, mon ami. Specific combinations of food will determine what type of grunty yours evolves into, with each server from infection onward offering three potential types of adult grunties. In Theta server, the player can raise a noble grunty, iron grunty, and poison grunty. Once raised, they will hang out in Theta server to be talked to or traded with. Once you've raised your first adult grunty, you will get the grunty flute, which can be used in the fields of the server your grunties exist in in order to ride them around. Each root town contains a chaos gate. As I mentioned earlier, there are several keywords the player can collect and then arrange to create fields to explore. These combinations affect many aspects of the area, including the battle level, element, and various other status factors you can see on the right. Most of these areas the player will explore will be fields and within those fields, dungeons. At the end of these dungeons are special areas that contain got statues, which offer one-time rewards for making it to the end of the area's dungeon. There are even special areas that contain zeit statues instead of the previously mentioned got statues. 
These special statues require the player to make it to the end of the dungeon within a certain amount of time, similar to a time trial, and will offer better, special rewards to the player. All of these areas will generally be full of monsters the player will fight, chests to open, grunty food, and buffs to pick up. There are even special springs the player can throw equipment into to potentially receive something better, or worse. For leveling, players need to gain 1000 EXP per level, but the level of monsters fought compared to that of the player determines how much experience they'll receive. For this reason, the player will usually need to use a combination of keywords that lead to areas that are adjusted for their current progress. The highest level areas in Infection are level 30, but players could theoretically get to level 99 before the second entry in the series through excessive grinding. Party members Kai takes along with him, a maximum of two per excursion, will level up alongside him while party members that aren't used will also level up, albeit slower. In battle, players will generally use the X button to attack over time. It's a pretty archaic system to be honest with you. The player merely taps X to consistently attack the monster, and if they want to use any items or skills, they need to open up their main menu each time and navigate to the specific things they want to use. Later entries like the GU series remedied this mildly by adding shortcuts for skills, but in the original Tetralogy, that's unfortunately impossible. What gives the battle system depth is how effective elements and buffs are. Through the use of scrolls, any player's class can effectively defeat enemies if they have an elemental weakness. Weapons and armor even come with built-in skills, some elemental. Items like Warrior's Blood and other buffs can be excessively stacked together to power up the character for a fairly long period of time, and skills like Abdu will produce an effect that allows the player to sprint across the map incredibly fast. Experienced players of the series can use menu management and appropriate buffs to steamroll enemies and get through dungeons in minutes, and it begins to feel more rewarding the better you get at it. You can also issue commands to your party members. The first thing you'll do is set the general strategy your party will use, like focusing on a single target. Then you can either give the entire party or individual individual members specific instructions on how they should operate each battle. For example, you'll often see me put Mistral into first aid mode at the start of each battle, or I may have the entire party cast skills, if I know they have elementally effective spells against whatever we are fighting. It may look like I'm fast forwarding through this footage, but it's actually just me using the app do spell on Kite so I can traverse the areas faster. There's a little more to combat thanks to Kite's bracelet, but to get into that we'll have to go over the broader aspects of hacking in the world. Let's do that now. Hackers are not new to the world, but Kite is not your traditional hacker. His bracelet allows him to perform various functions, but the most used mechanic is data draining, which will rewrite monsters' data. I talked about how using data drain on data bugs will remove their invincibility, but it can also be used on regular monsters. Doing so will turn regular monsters into very weak low-level mobs that can usually be killed in one hit. Now, doing so will mean less experience for the party, but it's a fairly important mechanic for multiple reasons. First is virus cores. Different sized mobs can offer either A, B, or C virus cores, while data bugs offer unique cores of other letters like N or Q. Specific combinations of these cores are required to perform what is known as gate hacking. Certain areas within the world are locked away, and through using a specific combination of cores, depending on the area, Kite can unlock the gate for any player within the MMO. You'll even see players comment about these areas being previously locked and now open on the BBS. Virus core grinding isn't too bad in the first game, but gets excessively grindy later on. For this reason, it's better for players to data drain fairly often, usually every other fight, to make sure that they are getting enough cores but not too often. See, every time Kite uses Data Drain, he raises his viral infection level. Get it too high and it's game over, but by killing mobs the traditional way, the infection will go down. Through excessive physical attacks, monsters will experience something known as Protect Break, and this is when Data Drain becomes accessible. Virus cores aren't the only reward for using this. Many mobs, especially in the higher level areas, have the potential to drop rare weapons which are highly effective for the endgame content. Data draining often will also unlock the 8 Ryu books over time. These are special key items Kite unlocks. By interacting with each of them in town, they will show various stats like how many unique people Kite has talked to or how many chests he has opened. By meeting certain checkpoints or goals, the player will unlock more background music, wallpapers, or movies to be used or customized on the desktop. We're nearing the end of everything I wanted to cover, but these next two topics are ones I find the most interesting overall. First are the Golden Goblins. The player will see a Golden Goblin mob post on the BBS, offering keywords that lead to a specific area. Here, Kite must chase down the Golden Goblin and defeat it. The trick is that the Goblin is incredibly fast, meaning speed buffs are required. There are multiple other Goblins that begin to appear after this, and they get progressively faster and more difficult to hit with each tier. Defeating each Goblin unlocks a unique piece of equipment, and wearing all of them together unlocks a special summon ability. I wouldn't recommend it though, as the equipment isn't that good in comparison to what you get throughout the game. 
Kite can meet three optional characters that are willing to join his party. These include Natsume, Sanjiro, and the best girl, Gardenia. Natsume and Sanjiro are each looking for a specific weapon at a specific location. By completing the dungeon, obtaining the weapon, and agreeing to give it to them, they'll offer you their member address so that you can use them in your party. Gardenia is a little different. She's an incredibly popular player with her own fan club that she seems to actively avoid. You have to hunt her down to deliver a letter from said fan club. In the process, you prove to Gardenia how strong you are and she agrees to go on more endeavors with you. The last optional event takes place after the storyline of Infection. Upon defeating Scathe and watching the end credits, Kite will receive an email with keywords to a special location within the world that will bring him to a legendary land area known as the Aerial Fleet. At the end of this dungeon is a super boss known as Parasite Dragon, who is particularly difficult regardless of your level. Just make sure you data drain him as it offers one of the best weapons in the game for Kite by this point in the series. Okay, now for the final major features within the series. Liminality. Dothack Liminality is a four-part OVA series that is meant to accompany each part of IMOQ. They came packaged with the game, meaning each release contains two discs. I won't go too far into the storyline of Liminality, but each part takes place at some point during the main games, and you can see some of this through the news reports on your desktop. There's a few easter eggs one can find within these Liminality discs, like finding the timeline to the series in the DVD's main menu. There are even keywords you can find within watching the OVA that can be used in-game to get some rare equipment for the player and their party. Each game in the series has received mixed reviews, but Dot .hack Infection was one of the more positively reviewed games within the series due to it being the introduction to such a unique premise. Apparently, someone complained about the lack of difficulty, which is funny to me. Rather than a lack of difficulty, I found that the game had these incredibly insane spikes in difficulty that don't mesh well with the mechanics of the battle system. You could be in an area that was low level to you, but due to some of the status ailments or abilities the enemies can spam cast, you could often find yourself in fairly dire situations. A lot of reviewers looked past the flaws of the core gameplay thanks to the atmosphere, concept, and compelling storyline, and that really is the main draw. Sure there's a game there, but Dot .hack is so much more than that. What really pulls you in are the unique locations, the music, the art style, the story, and so much more. You can dive into a new world and really feel like you're experiencing some sort of online event, even today, albeit a little dated. I don't have a huge outro for this entry, but I will say this. Do what you have to to play these games, just so you can experience the unique storyline. Do what you have to to watch Dot .hack sign. Hell, if you can't do that, at least go play the GU Trilogy. They recently remastered the entire trilogy in one release, and even offered a fourth chapter for players to experience. I must speak with Morgana to go where she wishes. The living flesh poses a hindrance, but I must, I must go for our aura. Dot .hack Mutation picks up almost immediately after the events of the first game. Our protagonist joined the world at the behest of his real-life friend Yasuhiko, who is known as Orca within the MMO. After an encounter with a creature known as Scathe, Orca ended up in a coma, and soon after Kite received a special bracelet that allowed him to alter the data and objects within the world. Teaming up with multiple other players, Kite began investigating the whereabouts of Scathe and ultimately confronted the creature and defeated it. Unfortunately, soon after this event, a colossal beast known as Kubia was a Woken and Kite and his party were forced out of the game. Now, within the timeline of the second entry, Kite logs back into the world and, along with Black Rose, return to the dungeon where they confronted Scathe. Unfortunately for the duo, the entrance to this area of the dungeon is blocked off and Kite and Black Rose have no choice but to log out. Soon after, Aura contacts Kite via email. In their previous encounter, Aura had been dismantled into multiple data fragments and shot out across the world. However, she still has the means to contact Kite and informs him that she needs to be collected and brought back together in order to be reborn. Kite and Black Rose are also contacted by an anonymous source who claims to have the ability to shed light on the events that have transpired and the coma victims. However, when they arrive at the designated meeting location, they are confronted by the MMO's system administrators, specifically Leos, who wants to delete them to keep control over the world, believing it to be the solution to preventing further issues while the administrators investigate the data bugs. Helba intervenes and convinces Leos to try observing Kite and Black Rose since they seem to be the only ones able to actually do anything. She also suggests that Kite investigate the epitaph of Twilight, suggesting that the world is based off of this poem. If you remember from my previous video, I mentioned that this was the case. 
This leads to the group basically running administrator errands for Leos and investigating infected areas he sends them to. One of these areas leads Kite to a failed data character who acts oddly in comparison to your typical player or NPC, but nothing really comes out of this. Upon investigating further infected areas, Kite and Black Rose run into another creature similar to Scathe known as Innis and manage to defeat it. However, defeating Innis causes shockwaves throughout the world and leads to a system crash, which sours Leos' opinion of the group further. Kite meets up with Mistral after receiving keywords from Aura about a special area. Miss Stroll initially believes Kite is simply role-playing when he explains everything that has transpired, but soon comes to believe him when the group runs into Kubia. In their first altercation with the Beast, Kite and Mistral manage to drive Kubia off, and Mistral soon begins to believe everything Kite has told her to be real. Further investigations lead to another white room, and another altercation with Baomung who implores Kite to stop trying to interfere as he seems to believe that Kite is only making things worse for the world. Kite and Black Rose meet up with an information broker within the game known as Wise Man, who promises to give them all the info he has on the epitaph of Twilight if they retrieve an item from a specific area for him. This area is protected, however, and turns out to be a test designed by Wise Man to find out more about the characters, figuring out that they have the ability to gatehack. Despite this, Wise Man stays true to his word, and offers his member address as well as emailing Kite all he has about the poem. The section of the poem Wise Man offers details eight phases of the Cursed Wave. These phases include Scathe, the Terror of Death, Innis, the Mirage of Deceit, Magus, the Propagation, Fidhel, the Prophet, Gore, the Machinator, Maha, the Temptress, Tarvos, the Avenger, and finally Korbinek, the Rebirth. These eight phases are known as the Cursed Wave, and if you were paying attention, you can see that Kite has already run into two of them. Additionally, these were the names listed on the Statue of Aura in Delta Hidden Forbidden Holy Ground. Wise Man also suggests that the group talk to Helba again, and informs them that she can be found in a special location known as Netslum, offering a sort of spell or password to access it. However, they are missing the keywords for the area. A BBS post points them in the direction of another failed data character who gives them said keywords. The area is protected, however, and it's none other than Baomung that provides the group with the required virus core. Yeah, Baomung. That Baomung. Why would he do this? Well, in an earlier scene, it is implied he received the core from Leos, with instructions to hand it to Kite. Can you see where this is going yet? Anyway, Kite and Black Rose gate hack into the area and enter the field's dungeon. However, traversing the first floor of the dungeon requires the passcode given from Wise Man and the group has to travel east, north, south, west, and north again in order to move forward. Afterward, the remaining floors function like your typical dungeon, and through traversing it, the group eventually arrives at Netslum. Netslum is an off-the-grid location within the world, and considered a paradise to the old, failed data characters that live there. Specifically, Kite and Black Rose meet Tatarga, that explains how old, failed NPCs have drifted here and starts to blur the line between programmed and biological life. A large amount of the individual Individuals here have created their own identities and seem to believe they truly exist and are cognizant. Well, Helba finally shows up to discuss the poem with Kite, quoting a passage about a being known as Morgana. We'll learn more about Morgana in later volumes. Until then, guess who crashes the party? That's right, it's Baomong, and it turns out, shocker, that he's been working with Leos to discover the location of Netslum so that they can return order to the world. Helba suggests that there's the order the world wants and the order that Baomong wants, and questions which he thinks is more valid. Leo shows up soon after to attempt to delete everyone, but is interrupted by the invasion of the third phase of the cursed wave, Magus. Kite and Black Rose defeat Magus, but this causes the world to further deteriorate, with Netslum falling apart. As they return to the root town, they are met with it being fully corrupted, similar to infected areas. And it's not just the new root town either. This outbreak of viral infection is where the game ends and leads into part 3 of the series. Well, whatever is happening in the world isn't all that's going on. In fact, the events are having real life repercussions that take place within the OVA Liminality series. Let's go over the plot of the first two parts now. It's just absurd. Uh, uh, the case of Mimi Nase takes place roughly halfway through the events of infection, and players will actually receive a news article about two students going unconscious, those being Mai and Tominari. Anyways, this episode focuses on the title character who was recently attacked by Skaith in the world upon being introduced to the game by her new boyfriend, Tominari Kasumi. Mai and Tominari are found unconscious in their high school's computer lab by Mai's friend Masaya Makino and rushed to the hospital where she wakes up. Unfortunately, similar to Orca slash Yasuhiko, 
though, Tominari is in a coma. Mai returns to school and has multiple run-ins with an enigmatic man known as Junichiro Tokuoka, who knows about what happened to her and presses her for information. Mai, worried about the events that have taken place, is cautious of Tokuoka and generally ignores or avoids him. The event takes a toll on her mental state and on her hobby of the violin, which upsets her mother and leads to a bit of a conflict between her and Mai. Mai investigates into Tokuoka and finds out that he works for CC Corp, but it's later clarified by Masaya that Tokuoka actually quit. Mai runs into Tokuoka again when visiting Tominari in the hospital. He pleads his case to her without revealing much about what he knows, and she agrees to sit down with him for an initial investigation into the world. They use Tominari's login information to access his account through the Ultimate OS, revealing his in-game character name as Sieg. Tokuoka explains that there are already six comatose victims in Japan alone, but Mai initially believes Tokuoka to be trying to cover his tracks in regards to the coma victims and the world world and soon runs away from him as he pressures her for answers. Mai remembers the sound she heard when initially running into Scaith, A in C major, and her trained ears allowed her to use this to prevent going comatose somehow. Tokuoka calls up Mai later and apologizes for acting so aggressively, and she agrees to work with him again because she's just desperate for answers. Tokuoka asks for access to the computer lab where Mai and Tominari fell unconscious, and she agrees, taking him there late at night when the school is shut down. Tokuoka recreates the scene by using a clone character of Sieg and having Mai log in with him. Together, they go back to the area within the world where the event took place, and Mai quickly hears the sound of A and C major again, as well as the two of them seeing a silhouette of Scaith. Apparently, this is supposed to be a possessed Sora from Dot Hack Sign, who was data drained by Scaith near the end of the series, but honestly, I'm not sure how you're supposed to be able to tell that. Aware of impending danger, Mai quickly disconnects herself from the game, but has to destroy the entire setup in order to save Tokuoka, who almost goes comatose. Masaya shows up just in time to help Mai with Tokuoka, and they wake him up by having built up water from the rain splash onto his face. Mai realizes the world isn't just a video game, and agrees to continue investigating with Tokuoka, effectively ending the first OVA. The case of Yuki Aihara actually takes place after mutation and within some point during Outbreak. An event within the world causes real world events which we'll go over now, but I won't go into much detail about what actually happens in the world until part 3. This episode opens up with Tokuoka dropping Mai off at the library in Tokyo to do research on Fragment, the beta for the world, while he leaves for Yokohama to meet someone. Yuki Aihara is the daughter of flower shop workers in Yokohama. Her brother has agreed to work in the family shop and has gotten married to his wife Miho who is pregnant. This seems to bother Yuki who feels like she isn't receiving any attention. She goes off for the day to see a movie in a mall within the city. Unfortunately during the showing, the film cuts out and is replaced with the title card for The World. There is then a citywide blackout which causes multiple electrical disasters, including the shutdown of the mall Yuki is in, trapping her. Around the start of the blackout, Mai hears A and C major, which worries her, but she continues her investigation and comes across an article about Harold and the Epitaph of Twilight which she realizes is what she's been looking for. It's revealed through a phone call with Mai that Tokuoka went to Yokohama to meet up with Yuki, which she most likely didn't disclose to her family. This is likely due to a friend of Yuki's being one of the coma victims, which is revealed as Yuki traverses the mall in order to escape. Yuki is aided in an escape by Kaoru Asaba, an office worker within the building. They soon find out that many of the ovens within the food court must have been left on and realize they need to escape before a fire breaks out or a possible explosion. The rest of the OVA is fairly uneventful, with Yuki and Kaoru managing to escape through an elevator shaft without much issue. Tokuoka is late to his meeting with Yuki due to the blackout causing a buildup in traffic, but manages to ditch his car for a bike and arrive 6 hours late. Yuki and Tokuoka each receive phone calls. Tokuoka is informed by Mai about the epitaph. Yuki, picking up on this, realizes that she's heard about it before from none other than the woman on the other end of her own phone call, Kyoka Tono. Kyoko states that she must meet with Tokuoka, and this is where the OVA ends. As already mentioned, this part of the series actually takes place after mutation, and the cause for the blackout won't be made clear until the third entry within IMOQ. In the meantime, let's take a look at all the new gameplay features within this volume. Are you saying that if I blame someone, those who are in comas will awake and return to normal? Then, okay, sure, I'll accuse them all you want. Kazu's still in the hospital, bring him back! Access to a new server is one of the main features of this volume. Lambda server is 
finally unlocked and it comes with the root town Carmina Gedelica, which functions as a large bustling city location. This new town offers better spells, equipment, and consumables from various shops, but the main thing unlocked through Carmina Gedelica are the new Grunties and the Grunty flag races, which we'll get into later. Field areas can now go all the way up to 50, meaning it'll be easier for players to reach this level by grinding various dungeons, but combat has received even more of a difficulty spike. Enemies hit much harder and are more prone to using status ailments, and many are resistant to not only a single element, but potentially all physical or magical attacks. This means it's much more important for the player to build the right party composition for the area they want to explore, making sure they have the right elemental spells for some monsters. This generally requires the player to offer equipment to their party members, as well as make sure they have all the skills necessary to be effective. For example, giving Mistral the Bat Earrings allows her to use the Ol' Repth healing ability, which is the most effective at this point in the game. Data Drain also receives a bit of an upgrade in this game, but you'll rarely ever use it. After the player initially uses Data Drain in Mutation, they'll unlock a new ability called Data Arc, which allows the player to Data Drain multiple enemies at once, as long as they're all protect broken. Again though, this isn't really useful at all by this point in the game. Gate hacking will almost always require a new set of cores that can be obtained from monsters above level 30. These include Virus Core D, which can be obtained from small mobs, Virus Core E from medium-sized mobs, and Virus Core F from large-sized mobs. Players should make sure to collect as many of these as possible while watching their viral infection level, as Virus Core grinding can get pretty out of hand in the future. There are four new optional party members that you can acquire in this volume. Nuku Sagi Maru and Rachel are the first new members you'll meet and each is unsuccessfully trying to host an event within the world. Nuke is a long arm and is attempting to host a battle talk show but his comedy is so bland that everyone except Kite leaves. Upon meeting him at the end of the dungeon and helping him with the area's boss, you will receive his member address. Rachel is a blade master and is attempting to run a trade event, but is missing a crucial item to make all of the trades between the members work. Kai travels through the dungeon to get the required item and performs a series of trades to make her event a success. Upon doing so, Kite receives Rachel's member address as well. While traversing these dungeons, Kite will run into the twin blade character Moonstone multiple times. After running into Moonstone three times through optional side content, he will offer his member address to Kite. Finally, after completing the fight against Kubia, Kite will be contacted via BBS to meet at a specific dungeon and will run into the Blade Master Marlow. Upon helping Marlow with the dungeon's boss, he will also offer his member address. Golden Goblins also mark the return in this volume. There are another five challenges Kite can take part in to earn various parts of the new Golden Goblin set. Having all pieces equipped offers another Goblin Summon spell, but it isn't terribly useful. If you remember in my previous video about Infection, I stated that all servers other than Makanu allowed you to raise Grunties and each of these servers have three specific Grunties you can raise. Well, Theta and Lambda server both allow you to raise a Noble Grunty, but Carmina Gadelica comes with two new categories, those being Snaky Grunty and Bone Grunty respectively. Flag races are a special minigame event that Kite can take part in in both Theta and Lambda server. In these minigames, the player must ride their Grunty within the town and collect three flags. The faster their time, the better their placing, and placing in either first or second offers special stat-raising items known as Gold and Silver Grunties that raise a character's max HP and SP. The player can win the second place and third place prizes up to three times before the NPC runs out of rewards, but in order to do this, they have to beat their previous times. For this reason, the player is better off saving and making sure they beat the old records, but not by much. This allows the player to consistently win and receive the items which are incredibly useful when it comes to upgrading your party's stats. Each Grunty has its own strengths and weaknesses when it comes to Grunty races, but generally Bone Grunty is best for Lambda and Iron Grunty is best for Theta. Just like in the previous volumes, there's a few special areas that you can get the keywords for by watching Liminality or Sign DVDs. I won't list them here, but you can find them on the wiki, and these areas will offer you a few rare items that can be used for trades and other various purposes. Upon completing the game's storyline, Kite will receive the keywords to another optional endgame dungeon that's unique in design in comparison to the other areas found within the game. The dungeon is pretty short and culminates with the players fighting against a super boss known as Angle More. God, I hope I pronounced that right and I'm sorry if I didn't, but anyways, players that took out Parasite Dragon from the previous game will probably find this boss extremely easy in comparison. In fact, honestly, nothing in Mutation is really as difficult to scathe or Parasite Dragon from Infection, except for maybe the Kubia encounter. 
Finally, there are a very special set of optional events that can occur, from meeting multiple characters from Dot Hack Sign to even experiencing memories of the events from the anime. Kite can find a conversation on the BBS between two characters from Sign known as Bear and Mimiru, who have similar character designs to Orca and Black Rose. Entering the area they are supposed to meet in will have Kite run into another Sign character known as A20, and upon completing the dungeon, meet Mimiru, who gives Kite her sword. Additionally, there are four separate scenes within the chapel of Hidden Forbidden Holy Ground, where scenes from the anime will be reenacted. First is the scene where Bear and Mimiru confront Tsukasa, the protagonist, about their real-life gender. The second features characters from the anime discussing Tsukasa and their actions within the world. The third is rather special, as it focuses on Sora, who is another victim of Scathe. Fun fact, after the events of IMOQ, Sora loses his memory and actually ends up as the protagonist of the .hack GU series in the world R2. The final scene is an altercation between Sora and the long arm character Krim. Each of these events offers specific items which are required in later volumes for unlocking certain optional party members, but we won't spoil that until we get to it. Maybe this was a turning point. The relationship between me and the game, The World, has gone beyond pure amusement. Dot .hack Mutation offers the most content and gameplay for the player to experience so far and really starts to touch on the general themes of the game's plotline. Are AIs really alive? Can data feel and establish its own identity? Is the world alive in some capacity? And if so, what does it want? The line between reality and virtual reality begins to blur. The mystery deepens and players have to ask themselves, are Kite and Black Rose helping anything by defeating these phases and fighting Kubia? All it seems to be doing at this time is destroying the world over time, and that's with only three of the eight phases defeated. The next part of this history series will cover Dot .hack Outbreak, the third part of the IMOQ Tetralogy, and explore the results of Kite's actions within the world. Dot .hack Outbreak, like the game before it, picks up immediately after the previous storyline events with us finding Kite and Black Rose witnessing the effects of the Cursed Wave on the various root towns in the world. The infection is spreading after the death of Magus, one of the eight phases, and all root towns and many areas within the world now have noticeable visual glitches beginning to spread all over them. As a short recap, Kite is looking to defeat the eight phases and the Cursed Wave in an attempt to save his friend Yasuhiko, aka Orca in the world, who fell into a coma at the hands of Scaith, another of the eight phases. Having received a special bracelet from an enigmatic AI known as Aura, Kite now goes around using the power of Data Drain to defeat bugs and enemies that would be invincible otherwise. If you want a much better understanding of the storyline, make sure you watch the previous two videos in the series going over infection and mutation. What are you even doing here if you haven't Watch those two. Come on. Within Outbreak, Kite soon runs into Mia, who is continuing to act in a way that is highly irregular in comparison to her personality within Infection. It becomes clear that whatever is affecting the world is affecting her, though Kite doesn't seem to realize this yet. Kite also runs into Mistral, who informs him that she's pregnant in the real world and soon to give birth, meaning she can't take part in anything too dangerous or stressful. This directly leads into her not being available for this entry, and players are forced to utilize wise 
Wise Man as their dedicated healer should they require one. Within a dungeon, Kite runs into Baomeng who is fighting against a data bug. After saving him, Baomeng apologizes for his earlier betrayal during the events of Mutation and asks Kite if they can work together from then on, realizing that the bracelet is the key to defeating the infection. Afterward, Kite meets with Black Rose in Hidden Forbidden Holy Ground, where she finally conveys to Kite that the reason she is fighting is because her brother fell into a coma and is one of the victims of the Cursed Wave. Both her and Kite had been having doubts about their actions since things only seemed to be getting worse, but she used this opportunity to bolster Kite's resolve so that they could keep pushing forward. For the next few story beats, Kite and his party begin collecting various virus cores for later gate hacking, specifically multiple virus core O's. Aura sends a glitched out email to Kite informing him of Fid Hell, the next phase to be dealt with, and news articles begin popping up talking about major network issues and glitches happening in the real world due to the infection within the game. Leos is confronted by Baomeng as Kite shows up to meet him. Both players have lost patience with Leos due to his betrayals and overall lack of communication, but Leos seems to care very little, instead tasking the two with exploring a dungeon to analyze the infection. He agrees to go with them to see for himself and begins to realize that the world will be completely consumed by the infection if things keep going the way they are. Soon after, Kite's party goes to meet Aura, but the meeting is interrupted as they run into Cubia for another encounter, and Leos witnesses the party manage to repel it. The group realizes that Cubia seems to not only be getting bigger, but also directly trying to intervene whenever the party tries to talk to Aura. After repelling Cubia, Kite wants to stop working haphazardly and instead have everyone join forces, meaning Leos and Helba, who are normally at odds. Black Rose concocts a plan to have Leos and Helba meet in the net slum by writing a provocative BBS post, and once done, Kite explains to Leos that they need to start working together, believing that while Leos is a CC Corp employee, he still cares about the world and the victims that are in a coma. Leos informs the party that there is a data bug in a specific location, and if they can beat it without data drain, he will work with them. While this sounds impossible, Kite agrees to the confusion of Black Rose, and the party goes to fight said data bug, or data bug, or whatever, managing to kill it without data drain. Leos asks why they didn't use data drain and explains that it is a fake data bug he created for the test. Kite explains that he knew Leos saw them fight Kubia, and he knows Leos is a good person who cares about the world. Leos hearing this, and Kite's pleas, agrees to help. In the final events of the storyline, Kite, Black Rose, Baomeng, Wise Man, Leos, and Helba locate the next phase, Gore, and commence a unified operation titled Breakwater to take it out, which they succeed in. The title of the operation Breakwater is significant and it is a means within the real world of using one wave to cancel out another. By creating a party of individuals unified against the phases, Kite has created a wave that will cancel out the cursed opposition. Upon finishing off Gore, Helba explains that there's huge data movement in one of the servers, in effect the wave. Kite explains that they now understand the game that Harold created within the world and they have successfully committed a counterattack against the wave. The story ends here and continues in the next and final volume. Now while everything going on in the world is fairly eventful, there's more detective work going on outside of the game at the same time, and for that reason it's time to talk about the third entry within the Liminality OVA series. While the previous OVA entry was more action oriented due to the network complications affecting the real world, the third entry, in the case of Kyoko Tono, is much more of a slow burn and looks to shed some light on the mystery of the world's creation and the epitaph of the Twilight. In this entry, Junichiro Tokuoka visits Kyoko Tono in Takayama as she is one of the members of his new party to fight against CC Corp and learn more about the coma victims and the world. Kyoko receives a text message from none other than Helba, someone we know well within the game's narrative, but not so much within liminality. Kyoko specifically is very wary of Helba, who Tokuoka mentions is known to be a notorious hacker. Tono also mentions that Helba is the Queen of Darkness within the epitaph. Tokuoka also receives a phone call from the reception desk of the hotel he is staying at despite not telling anyone where he was going. The person on the other line is Bith the Black, another character from the Epitaph and someone working alongside Helba, but nothing comes from it immediately. Instead, Tokuoka and Kyoko follow clues laid out from Helba. Some of these clues come directly from Mai and Yuki as they received strange emails addressed to them that seem to come from Tokuoka and Kyoko. This infers that Helba is aware of all present members of the party and has them all under surveillance. The duo are led to a museum for a famous researcher by the name of Tomokichi Fukura, who studied clairvoyance and 
spirit photography for real. Here, Kyoko lays out a bit of the story found within the epitaph for Tokuoka, since there seems to be a connection between this professor and the story. On their way out, they meet with an old woman who gives them their next clue, and catch a glimpse of a man within a taxi cab who seems to be spying on them. Kyoko's father picks the two of them up during some downtime, and he explains that Tokuoka wasn't the only one interested in the epitaph today. Kyoko's parents are researchers and work for the local paper, and a man named Ichiro Sato paid him a visit to get more details about the book, but the father refused. The point of refusal was how much trouble the epitaph was overall, having first appeared online authored by Emma Wyland, with said original version being lost when she died at the age of 28. Many people were interested in the story, including occultists, but only 70% of it was found and restored, albeit inaccurately. For this reason, it's become impossible to tell what is from the original and what is just a fabrication. Kyoko explains a bit about about Emma's backstory, touching on how she was a high-maintenance girl from a rich family who had both of her parents die. An uncle wanted to adopt her for her inheritance, but she refused. However, the inheritance was a trust fund that she would only receive when she was 20, so she went to school for nursing in the meantime. At the age of 20, she became ill and began coughing up blood, only to have some sort of spiritual experience that they don't really go into too much detail about. Due to this, she gained an interest in the supernatural and picked up on the researcher Tomokichi's work. Harold, the creator of Fragment and The World, also used the research for his own work on AI. While following another clue from Helba, the pair run into Ichiro, who introduces himself as both Ichiro and Bith the Black, the individual working alongside Helba. They all go out for a meal, and Ichiro explains that if Fragment were created as a literal representation of the world within the epitaph, then the network issues it's experiencing shouldn't be happening. But if that's the case, then what is causing all of the issues? They also have a discussion on consciousness and how Harold brought the outward, inward, bringing the real world into the virtual. It's all philosophical. They're eating Big Macs. It's hilarious. They briefly mention the title of the OVA, Liminality here, where you can like point at the screen. You can say, they said it. They said liminality. I, ma I made it to the point where they said liminality, which is a term used within anthropology, which refers to the transition between two states, suggesting that what Harold brought into the world is autonomous and changing gradually. Finally, Ichiro explains that for them to figure out what Harold was doing, they'd have to commit to action together and potentially become criminals in the process. He waits for the pair to agree before explaining to them what has to be done, but this is off screen and kind of left as a cliffhanger at the end of the OVA. Like you don't, you know that they have to do something criminal, but you don't know what it's going to be. The group is told that they will be contacted next on Christmas Eve. The biggest addition to the servers is the new Sigma server root town being added and explorable. However, the new root town, Fort Oof, or Oof, I'm not sure, is full of visual glitches and errors just like every other root town previously explorable in the game. This does not remedy at all during the entirety of this volume's progression. Fort Oof, or Oof, is one of the larger root towns added and includes two new grunties to unlock, new flag races, and new items to be purchased from its weapon, magic, and item shop. While the previous volume allowed players to explore areas up to level 50, Outbreak increases the cap within Sigma server and some special areas to 70, with most players reaching around level 72 on their party if taking part in almost all of the content and collecting most unique items. The difficulty spike present in Mutation is also noticeable here. Most enemies are tolerant to either physical damage or magical damage, meaning not only is the right party composition necessary, but you need to be meticulous and telling said party what actions to use or using the right items to remove said tolerances. Enemies also hit like a truck, either through magic or a high damage death attack that can completely one-shot you if you're not prepared. Items are a necessary resource, and there are multiple locations Kite has to solo, meaning there's a lot of grinding and planning necessary. Honestly, this was probably where the game really started to show its age and weakness. Playing IMOQ at a high level, you can really plan around 
around your enemies and be incredibly effective. But if you don't cover for every possible situation, you'll find a lot of the areas turn out to be expensive and long slogs within an archaic battle system that does not really hold up to modern standards. Now within combat, you'll be running into a lot more data bugs than in the past. Kite will be using data drain more than ever, not just because of data bugs, but because of how many new virus cores you'll need. New cores G, H, and I are added within this volume and the player will need around 15 of each before the end of the final volume. Luckily previous volumes cores can now be collected within dungeons as visible items to pick up without the use of data drain. Speaking of data drain, Kite gains the new ability of 2128 drain, which functions the same as its normal counterpart for a higher SP and infection cost, but allows for the chance of better rare item drops from the monster. Moving on to optional content, there's only one new party member within this volume for the player to pick up. Terajima Ryoko is a heavy axeman who accidentally put her real name as the name of her character. If that doesn't tell you enough, while she's mechanically useful in a gameplay sense, the narrative portrays her as fairly naive and inexperienced within the mechanics of the world, even needing to be saved by Kite within an optional dungeon after running off to fight a strong monster. Many, many previous original party members will have side quests for you to take part in, usually either wanting you to go to specific areas with them for an item or to defeat a specific monster, or for some other narrative-driven reasons, such as Rachel opening a delivery service of all things. I'm not joking when I say about half of the game is made up of these quests if you unlocked all of the previous optional party members. It's too much, man. And some of these guys are underleveled, so you're just getting one shot the entire time and making you waste healing items and resurrection items on them, and it's just costing you money. Like, come on, Moonstone, put your back into it a little bit so I don't have to carry your ass into a level 4 basement of a high level dungeon. On the topic of minorly annoying side quests, there's a new set of optional Golden Goblin trials as well. If you don't remember from the previous videos, these tasks involve the player entering into an area solo and killing a single golden goblin who runs around the map at high speeds, meaning the use of buffs and items are necessary to succeed. To make this even worse, most of the trials in Outbreak have you fighting not one but three goblins at a time, many of whom can either heal each other, deal magic damage against you, or both. The general strategies usually remain the same, with using a speed buff, damage buff, and accuracy buff to take out the goblins, but later on they get so fast that you need to start casting sleep spells on them to even get a hit in, and eventually spells to remove their magic tolerance so that you can blow them away with elemental spells. For Grunties, Noble Grunty marks its return within Sigma server with Melky Grunty, Melky Grunty, and Aqua Grunty making their first appearances. Melky Grunty and Aqua Grunty. And Aqua Grunty's terrifying. Awful. Flag races also return, and I won't be going into them again, but there's a brand new mechanic for when you ride your Grunty out on the field. Now each of the three Grunties per server can search for portals or items for you while you ride them. An example is Noble Grunty being able to find Grunty food for you. Simply ride Noble Grunty and press triangle and it will automatically traverse to the closest location. Grunties like Snakey or Melky can also take you to the nearest monster portal, making clearing field portals much easier and less time consuming overall, which is great for Ryu books. In the previous volume, you could go to specific areas to watch cutscenes that were recreations of scenes that happened within the companion anime series Dot Hack Sign. This is not to be confused with Dot Hack Liminality. This is a completely different series, it takes place around the same time, I believe, before the events of uh, Dot Hack. MOQ. You even got to meet Mimiru and be gifted her sword. In this entry, there's a much more involved side quest that leads to a lot of decent stat raising items, specifically the hunt for sign character ghosts. Starting with Mimiru, the player can visit a specific location within a specific root town to find a ghost version of Mimiru that will vanish upon talking to her. The player will in turn receive a special desktop wallpaper featuring a bunch of silhouettes of various sign characters. The player can do this in several locations several times to unlock the next sign character and repeat the process. You'll start with Mimiru, then find BT, then Bear, Sora, Krim, Silver Knight, A20 for some reason, Subaru, and finally the main character of sign, Sukasa. A20 is a really weird choice, as she wasn't incredibly relevant in the anime in comparison to the other characters you meet. Each time you complete the six encounters 
per character, their silhouette will be replaced with a picture of the character themselves, but the true reward of this endeavor isn't seen until the final volume of the series. Finally, there are three special areas to explore in this volume. The first is a high level area best saved for near the end of the storyline, where players will visit a dungeon they are tipped off about within the BBS. It is said that a person witnessed a red wand in this area and said red wand was utilized by Scathe and Infection. When Kite reaches the end of the dungeon, he finds the wand and watches as it is destroyed, freeing the trapped Sora character within it. Confused? Sora was a twin blade character from Sign who was attacked and possessed by Scathe during the events of that series. Once Kite defeated Scathe and found the wand, Sora was finally set free. Fun fact, the character comes off as fairly childish within the anime and this is due to the player behind Sora actually being like a 12 year old. Like he's, I think it's 12, I think he's 12 years old. After the events of IMOQ, Sora grows up without any memory of the events that transpired and picks up in the world R2 as the main character of .hackgu, Haseo. You also get his signature weapons for freeing him. Next is a special area where you run into A20 who gives you a unique item for use in the final volume. Further into the dungeon, you can run into Elk who is searching for Mia and save him from a monster before you both run into Bear who offers you his sword after recognizing Elk to look a lot like Tsukasa from Dot Hack Sign. For the last area, just like the previous two volumes, completing the storyline unlocks a special endgame dungeon with a super boss at the end. This specific monster, Black Death, is particularly annoying due to how difficult it is to data drain it. Attacking with strictly melee will most likely kill the creature before data drain becomes an option, but magic isn't readily an option due to the monster having magic tolerance. Instead, the player is forced to use items or debuff spells to remove the tolerance and attack with magic until data drain becomes accessible. But this is really difficult because chances are the thing that you're going to use to get rid of the magic tolerance is going to miss, and it's going to one-shot you during that process because whenever you use a spell or whenever you're being attacked by a spell, you're pretty much stuck wherever you are. You can't move, and you can't use any actions while you're casting a spell, so it's awful, and you you just die. You just, you just watch yourself die, and you try again. I tried this fight like three, four, maybe five times. This also marks the end of all the optional content, aside from Ryu book grinding for new background music and wallpapers in Outbreak. Thanks to all the side quests and plot points, Outbreak is potentially the meatiest entry within the series, and with some of the toughest battles overall. It's also where virus core grinding becomes the most apparent and will continue into the final entry. Now, without a doubt, Kite and his party are fully on board for a counterattack against the Cursed Wave, looking to form a wave themselves that will cancel the events of the infection out and save the world as well as the various coma victims. The end is in sight, and soon all mysteries will be explained, hopefully. Outbreak is definitely one of the entries I remember the least within the series, but going back to it has a huge nostalgic aspect for me and many others. There's plenty of people begging for a remaster of IMOQ now that the same has happened for GU, but honestly, this game does show its age more and more every time I go back to it. While a remaster would be nice for preservation's sake considering how expensive the individual volumes are, IMOQ will be a rough experience to return to for many players who haven't played the game in years. The next part of this history series will cover the final entry dot hack quarantine and explore Kite and his party's efforts to finish off the rest of the cursed wave and the eight phases. There's only three left, including Maha, Tarvos, and Korbanek.
As always, we'll start with the storyline of the series. As a quick recap, the character we play as, Kite, began his adventures within the MMO The World after being invited by his friend Orca. Orca and Kite were both attacked by a viral data object known as Skate, and Orca was placed into a coma after being data drained. Kite received a bracelet from Aura that allowed him to do the same thing, but against the monsters and viral creatures within the game. Data draining and its secondary ability, gate hacking, allow Kite to travel to locked off areas within the game as well as destroy members of the cursed wave such as Scathe, Innis, Magus, and many others. Kite meets up with various other members including Black Rose, whose brother was also placed into a coma due to the events within the world. Kite teams up with the notorious hacker Helba and many other individuals within the world including the system admins to begin fighting against whatever lies within the world in order to save both his friends friends and the AI child Aura. The group untangle various mysteries on their adventures, including the motivations of the creator of the world, Harold Howerwick, and the AI creation system, Morgana Mode Gone whose job it was to create the ultimate AI before attempting to prevent it after gaining sentience, but we'll get into that a little bit later within Liminality. As Kite and his party begin defeating the eight members of the Cursed Wave, various aspects of the world begin to fall apart. Kite and his party also ran into an enigmatic monster known as Cubia that chases after Aura, leading to confrontations whenever she finds and talks to Kite. By the end of the third game, Cubia is still out there, but Kite and his party are ready to counterattack the cursed wave in order to save the world. Everything from here on will detail the story within quarantine. As I just mentioned, Kite and his group formed a counterattack against the cursed wave. Kite specifically felt he better understood Harold's game that had been laid out for them and how they were supposed to play it in order to defeat the remaining phases of the cursed wave, including Maha, Tarvos, and Corbinek. That's right, within one game of the quadrilogy, you are tasked with facing off against four phases in total, and if you watched the previous entries, you'd understand how taxing that can be on top of virus core hunting and various other mechanics within the game. After their meeting, Kite gets an email to meet up with Leos in the new Omega server, which you get to travel to only for it to quickly go offline. Helba manages to salvage the server by replacing it with her own, thus turning the Omega server city into a net aesthetic. Later on, Kite runs into Elk who is looking for Mia as she has apparently gone missing and he's starting to lose his marbles, you know, j just a little bit. Just a little bit. Which is a running theme for the character in the series that follows this one. If you watched my previous videos, you know that Mia has been acting a, a little weird for some time now, and we'll see the conclusion of her story arc shortly. Part of the team's plan is to deal with the wave of data by hitting it with a vaccine program created by Helba. Oddly enough, you never really see the vaccine physically or even its use. All of the phases are technically defeated by Kite. But there seems to be suggestions that Helba and the team with the vaccine are at least doing something, you know, in the background, but you, you never see it. The plan is to trap the phases by having system administration slowly track them. Kite references a similar setup to what orca whales do, trapping prey with a single exit of escape to herd them towards a dead end. He aptly names the next operation, Operation Orca. Meanwhile, the real world is experiencing its own host of issues via the network crisis created by Morgana and her cursed wave. The hospital that is housing Orca's comatose body, aka Yasuhiko, has a new bulletin explaining various issues with their machines. This prompts Kite and Black Rose into accelerating their plans and motivates them further. Before continuing, however, Kite is given a keyword by one of the Netslum NPCs, and this takes him and Black Rose to another dungeon with a herald room that reads off the epitaph. Elk agrees to join the team, but this will cause a few issues later due to his depressive spiral involving Mia. Pyros also calls on Kite for some help dealing with a scammer, but it's just a filler quest and turns out Pyros misunderstood, putting him in the wrong. Now, as the operation is put into place, Kite and his team travel to keyword cruel vindictive stars, and they'll actually have to come here three separate times, meaning you, the player, will have to explore this same dungeon three times as well. Unfortunately for Kite and the party, when they reach the end of the dungeon, it seems that the wave has dissipated and a new data spike has appeared elsewhere, prompting Kite and his party to chase after it. This leads them to Mia, who cries out in agony over her personality and identity being erased while transforming her into one of the cursed wave phases, Maha. Kite and his party defeat Maha in one of the longest cursed wave fights yet, and Maha turns back into Mia temporarily for Elk and Kite to see her as she dies. 
is. Elk loses his mind and blames Kite for what happened while Mia dissipates in Kite's arms. There is no real time to grieve however as Leos informs Kite that the wave has reappeared within cruel vindictive scars. The party heads back for a second time out of three times and runs into Aura which if you have been keeping up means that they also run into Kubia. This leads into another battle encounter where the party must defeat three of Kubia's cores one after another. These fights in particular are rather grating due to the core having either magic or physical tolerance and switching between them periodically. Once Kubia retreats, the party heads back to the Omega Server root town and every party member shows up to help with the final operations, including any optional party members you picked up throughout your journey within the quadrilogy. The party heads to Cruel Vindictive Stars for the third and final time, this time running into the phase known as Tarvos. Once defeated, Kite meets up with various Netslum NPCs within Omega Server who all disappear. Later on, they all post on the BBS providing keywords that will allow Kite to gain the virus cores necessary to visit Herald within the world. Each of these areas are incredibly important in terms of leveling up your party due to them housing a specific enemy known as Guardians. Guardians are creatures created by Morgana to exert her will where the phases typically cannot. For example, within the anime.hack sign, Tsukasa has a Guardian present with them that frequently defends them for reasons explained within the anime. Each Guardian appears gelatinous with a twilight bracelet within its core. The bracelet allows them to perform data drain within the anime, but I never saw this in the game itself. Once data drained, a guardian takes on the form of the bracelet itself. While being incredibly powerful, it's still relatively easy to defeat and can offer upwards of 520 experience per kill, making it a huge bonus to run into as you'll gain late game levels incredibly quickly. Once all four areas are cleared and the data bugs within them have been defeated, Kite will have four virus course necessary to enter one of the worst dungeons in the game. This is a 10 level dungeon full of data bugs, meaning that the player will be data draining a lot unless they get exceptionally lucky. Since data draining causes Kite's virus level to rise and getting it too high can lead to a game over, the player essentially has to make sure that they get the last hit in on any enemies to help lower their level. It is exceptionally grueling and it's only trumped by the even worse bonus dungeon at the end of the game. At the end of the dungeon, Kite and Black Rose come face to face with a program that looks like a rock. Some sort of, you know, some it's a rock. Containing the personality of Harold, although it seems somewhat corrupted. When Kite and Black Rose ask Harold how to stop what is happening, he explains that what is in motion cannot be undone. There will be either death or rebirth, and the group simply needs to see it through. That being said, he does inform Kite that things are always darkest before the dawn. Aura appears and, you guessed it, so does Kubia, who ultimately shatters the Herald software program and wipes him from existence. Aura explains to Kite that he cannot fight Kubia, as Kubia is essentially a shadow cast by the existence of his bracelet. For Kubia to exist, the bracelet must exist, and vice versa. This leads into another triple core battle followed by a two-phase Kubia fight. At the end, Kite realizes the only way to defeat Kubia is to destroy his bracelet, so him and Black Rose do just that, ending Kubia's reign of terror once and for all. Kite believes that even without the bracelet, now that they have aura, they will be able to find a way to defeat the final phase, Korvenek. Kite theorizes with his party that the epitaph of the Twilight could mean either death dusk or dawn, either death or rebirth, and he believes that Harold believed in Daybreak due to mentioning things are darkest before the dawn. He believes Harold knew what would come of them fighting the phases and Kubia, and therefore believes that they have the means to defeat Korbanek despite the bracelet being lost. This leads into the final confrontation in the game against Korbanek, the final phase of the Cursed Wave. The player has to fight through three rounds of the creature as it transforms over time from a seed to a leaf and then eventually a, a creepy set of eyes. During the second phase of the fight, Korbanek puts up a shield that can't be broken through, but Aura shows up with the personas of all the coma victims, including Orca, Black Rose's brother, and Sieg, who is the boyfriend of Mai from Liminality. These personas are able to weaken the shield protecting Korbanek and allow Kite and his party to deal the final blow, leading into the last phase of the battle. The server also begins to crash during this, but much to the surprise of Helba, it comes back online. This is important 
important later as it leads to a bit of an inaccuracy when connecting liminality to the game. Sieg specifically says something along the lines of Orca of the Azure Sea and Balmung of the Azure Sky I won't lose to you, and this is also a semi-important phrase to be brought up again later within liminality. Once near the end of the fight, Korbanek uses a special form of data drain known as Drain Heart, which manages to hit everyone except Kite as he is saved by Elk who takes the attack instead. He apologizes to Kite for being so awful before disappearing. Kite uses this as an opening to pursue Korbanek and try to land a killing blow. However, right before he can, Aura steps in front of him and takes the blow instead. This seems to cause her data to explode and act as the killing blow towards Korbanek. While Kite initially believes this to mean Aura has died, this is not actually the case and she has simply been reborn through the process as a full AI. With all the phases taken care of, everyone reunited with their party members as well as the coma victims who have all begun to wake up in the hospital. Later on, Kite logs in to talk to his friends while he and Orca head to the same first dungeon from the first volume in the series where Orca was initially attacked. This gives him an eerie feeling of deja vu, but they press on and meet with Aura who bestows Kite with another bracelet so it can be used within the endgame content of Quarantine. Kite's battle was witnessed by some other players within the world, and the BBS begins to refer to him and his friends as the Dot Hackers. Aura sends an email to Kite informing him that another birth is about to take place within the world, but something is trying to prevent it. This leads Elk and Kite into a whopping 15 level dungeon. Easily the worst and most grueling dungeon in the game as it is full of data bugs and you essentially have to be lucky in terms of data draining, praying your virus level doesn't rise too high as you advance. As Elk and Kite progress through the dungeon, they see Phase Maha, a cat-like version of Maha that appeared in the Dot Hack Sign series. Maha originally worked for Morgana, but betrayed her after Sukasa, the sign protagonist, showed her kindness. Maha sacrificed herself in that series, but with the death of Maha in the games, seems to have been reborn. At the end of the dungeon, Kite and Elk have to fight the Dawn Wanderer, which upgrades into the Temptress Lover midway through the fight in order to save Maha. When they do, Maha transforms and turns back into Mia. While this is good news and Mia remembers Elk allowing them to be reunited, she seems to have lost all of her memories from before infection. Recreating the scene from her first meeting with Kite where she talks about his bracelet and asks whether or not he can see it. Despite her memories being gone, Kite and Elk are simply happy to see that she's back, allowing the game to further end on a very positive note. That being said, what happens to Mia down the line, leading up to Dot Hack GU is pretty depressing, and Elk doesn't come out of it unscathed at all. That's for another video series, however, and the story of Dot Hack IMOQ technically ends here. But we're not done just yet. Now it's time to go over the events of the final episode of Liminality. Dot Hack Liminality Volume 4 Trismegistus is the final entry within the Liminality series, seeing Tokuoka, Mai, Yuki, and Kyoko all united for a raid on a high security data building where they hope to find evidence to take CC Corp to court. I'm not sure why the title of the OVA is what it is. Hermes Trismegistus is a Greek name for an Egyptian god surrounding mysticism and magic. I can only assume it has to do with the magical nature surrounding their job in the world. Tokuoka and the girls are on a small cruise ship eating sushi, implied to have all been paid for by Helda's group of hackers. They're on their way to meet with Ichiro Sato or Bith the Black from the previous volume and are infiltrating a mega float so that they can access the Maritime Information and Support Center, which has countless high power computers for them to access and make use of while trying to gain evidence on CC Corp. Ichiro meets up with the group and they take a smaller watercraft to the shore as it has less security than if they took the roads. The group discusses how data volumes within the game seem to be abnormally large and they often shrink back to normal size after some time. This discussion leads into Harold's motivations for the world and how he loved Emma so much that he looked to create their child as an AI within the game. Fragment, the prototype for the world, was merely a container for said child, that being Aura, and the fluctuating data volumes actually house the personas of individuals playing the MMO. By collecting their personality data and feeding it to Aura through the Morgana system, they could create the ultimate AI with a personality of their own. This system inadvertently created its own personality and thus became Morgana Mode Gone, 
since Morgana understood that her sole purpose was to birth Aura and therefore would be destroyed after the fact, Morgana did everything within its power to stop this from happening, including creating the cursed wave and creating the network crisis. The malice of the world is causing said network crisis and thus they can't have Helba help them directly currently, so it's up to the group to sneak in. The group manages to get into the main building and bypass the security system, although this does lead to a routine check. However, the security team doesn't see anything while investigating and begin heading on their way only to see that a vending machine was accessed 5 minutes ago by Yuki when Tokuoka asked her to get him a coffee. This leads Ichiro, Yuki, and Kyoko to distract security for as much time as possible while Tokuoka works on the server and Mai accesses the world through Seek's account. While accessing, she sees a message pop up from Seek expressing how he won't lose to Orca and Bao Meng. This is the same line we see Seek say in the game. Say that really f- See Seek say. See Seek say. Alright. Tokuoka manages to get the processes set up for his server, but is unable to link it with Helba's. This is because the events of Liminality are happening side by side with the Corbinic fight and leads to instability. Instead of linking with her server, he deems it necessary to replace hers with his own. During this point, we see Tominari, aka Sieg, in the hospital beginning to awaken from his coma. Mai begins to get motion sick and has to be temporarily saved from the game by Tokuoka, but she goes back in shortly after to help replace the server. Meanwhile, Yuki and Kyo are being chased by security. Mai mentions how she saw everyone in the game fighting to save the world and the coma victims. Now this is where a bit of inaccuracies between the games and OVA begin. In the games we see the problems on Helba's side because we see the server begin to crash during the Corbinic fight. They suddenly come back online and Helba is confused as to how this is the case. However in the anime, Ichiro shows back up to Mai and Tokuoka's location where Tokuoka informs him that they will replace Helba's server. Liminality implies that Helba knew about the plan all along, yet the games imply that she had no idea what happened. This could simply be a slip up between two teams trying to create parallels within the story. However, there is a theory that Helba is actually multiple people. It's possible the Helba Ichiro was talking to was not the Helba we interact with within the games. Regardless, Tokuoka and Mai managed to successfully swap the servers, allowing the characters within the game to continue their fight with Corbinek. Tokuoka and Mai abscond gone from the scene while Ichiro stays behind to meet with security. When they arrive, Ichiro explains that he is a network security analyst that works for the company and flashes a business card before walking off with the men that had come to take him in. He seemingly gets out of this situation scot-free. Tokuoka is not so lucky, however. As Yuki and Kyoko are cornered by security, they are saved by Tokuoka and Mai who knock out the men from behind. However, one wakes up and grabs Tokuoka and he tells the girls to run while there's still time. They do so and Tokuoka gets beaten for a short time before being thrown into some sort of jail by the security team. It's, it's not a police jail, but you can tell it's some sort of like security area. Now I had to look this up on the wiki as I was unsure where he ended up and how he got out, but Tokuoka does walk out of the jail after being beaten. The wiki states that this is because Helba expunged his records or something, but I could never find actual proof of this. Rather, I think the simpler answer would be that Ichiro convinced them to let him out since they were part of the network security analysts. Once out, he's met with the three girls who came to greet him and they mention how it's a shame they lost all the data they could have used against CFC Corp to bring them to court. However, Tokuoka pulls out a small data disk from his back pocket, implying he had the information they needed. The girls celebrate and Tokuoka suggests that they all go grab a bite to eat, ending the episode. Liminality is a rather special piece of media. I don't think I've ever seen a game series that actually provided an anime episode with each release like what .hack has done here. It's one of the most unique ways of presenting media to a player and effectively acted as a bonus to look forward to whenever you bought a new volume. While the overarching story of Liminality wasn't the deepest form of storytelling we've ever seen, the sheer aesthetic and vibe given off within each episode was fantastic to watch even today. The art style, music, and locations all lend themselves to make Liminality as great as it is. Most importantly, Liminality offered us a glimpse into the real world outside the MMO so we could see the effects the game's were having on Japan rather than just the various areas within the world. Liminality is a philosophical and anthropological concept. It discusses one's sense of self and identity and the transitional process we may go through or our society may go through during a catastrophic event. In a way, Kite's party and Tokuoka's team are dealing with liminality. 
Yuki specifically mentions how the old her has died, and she is excited to be the new version of herself. In the same way, everyone in the series has grown and transitioned in some way, shedding their past selves and becoming someone new entirely, seeing the birth of something new, similar to Aura being born as the ultimate AI. Now I'd like to move on from the real world of liminality and head back over to the MMO so we can discuss the various new and repeating gameplay features seen in Quarantine. So in terms of gameplay additions, there isn't much that is new, rather we have a lot of repeating concepts we have seen in previous entries. Obviously the first of the major additions is the new root town on Omega server, however as I mentioned in the story section, Kite is only here for a moment before it goes offline and is replaced with a net slum town. The net slum town can be accessed by any player as it acts as a replacement root town. It's incredibly small in comparison to all other towns, making it much easier to navigate to the various shops. Interestingly, Sigma Server, a town you visit after it's already been corrupted, can be visited after beating the game to see it in its original glory, along with its own town theme playing. This is the only time you see it this way. On the other side, the Omega Server root town is never replaced with its original version, meaning you never get to explore it unfortunately. In terms of generic gameplay, this is the volume where players can finally hit level 99. One of the best ways to get close to this is by grinding guardians, which I mentioned earlier due to them giving giving some of the highest EXP in the game. Some of the most annoying enemies will be found within this entry, however. Things that can essentially one-shot you, cast constant debuffs on you, or be tolerant to certain types of attacks all come in droves, meaning you have to be alert at all times while fighting, otherwise you could get overwhelmed in the blink of an eye. Items are incredibly necessary, and that means a lot of trips to shops, so having a lot of GP on you is essential. On top of annoying enemies, there are plenty of data bug areas within this volume, meaning not only do you have to fight a monster, but then data drain it to fight it again, and then finally kill it. Other than that, combat remains the same. You perform your basic attacks and spam skills or spells when necessary, and you tell your party to generally do the same unless you need one to be a designated healer. Speaking of data draining, this game requires the player to collect J, K, and L cores from small, medium, and large monsters respectively. It is highly recommended that you follow a guide or something through the previous volumes to make sure you always have enough cores going into the next volume, as receiving cores from previous volumes gets exponentially harder as you level up and progress throughout the game. Kite also receives a final data drain ability known as Drain Heart, which we see Corbinek use in the final fight of the game. It acts similarly to 2128 Drain in that it gives you a better chance at receiving rare items, but this one is an AoE version, and you'll probably never use it. In fact, you rarely even use 2128 Drain outside of trying to get some rare equipment for endgame bosses in each volume. There are no new party members for you to unlock throughout the initial playthrough of Quarantine, however post-game will net you a few, specifically Helba, who will be level 99 with maximum HP and MP, making her one of if not the best wave masters in the game. That's hackers for you. Additionally, you will obtain the member addresses for Sukasa, Subaru, and Sora. Now, there's been a lot of explanations on how to unlock them in the game, all the, all the way back to 2006. However, from my understanding, you will unlock Tsukasa and Subaru regardless of if you viewed all of the signed memory events and ghost characters' interactions within Mutation. However, I believe you only receive Sora if you freed him from Skaith's wand in Mutation, but this might be wrong too. I also saw somebody online on a forum claim that they're AI, but I've never seen proof of this. I don't even know why they would be AI technically, because you do save Sora. It, it could be the real him technically. Even if it's not canon, it could be him. To find out how the characters are unlocked, one would need to play through IMOQ from start to finish and guarantee that they skip all of the events to see what unlocks them, and I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that ever again. Ever. Players also unlock Orca as a party member at the end of the game, and can save Mia through the endgame bonus dungeon, making her available again as well. For side quests, Moonstone will invite you to a high level area that is good for grinding. This is really an excuse however, as he wants to obtain an item from the area's goth statue to give to a girl so he can get her member address. Rachel also gets a new dungeon and a player rescue service, where she and a party will go down into a dungeon to help out players that may find themselves stuck. This somewhat backfires 
that she gets treated as a delivery service to bring an item to another player, but in the end she accepts this as she was able to help someone out. Marlow gets a very useful dungeon where he drags Kite along to an area that has a large chest room at the end of the dungeon. There's about 11 chests in the room and many of them contain stat raising items. It's a way of Marlow showing his appreciation to Kite. A BBS post talks about Subaru and the Crimson Knights. One member asks Subaru to visit him with his specific keyword. Going to said area and grabbing the Got statue starts a cutscene where the players meet Krim from Dot Hack Sign. He doesn't join the party, but he does give them his spear. If the player gets Black Rose and Terajima both to 1000 affection, the maximum either can be. They will both send Kite an email to find a rare item in a dungeon. Both provide the same keyword and Kite has to take each of them along at the same time. The dungeon is full of forks in the road, causing Black Rose and Terajima to fight with one another over which way to go constantly. By choosing Terajima's route at least twice, Kite can obtain Subaru's axe. I found this one incredibly silly, considering fairy orbs exist within the game and show the player the map of the area, as well as where all the monster portals would be. They shouldn't have been arguing over this because it's a clear game mechanic that they would know where to go. The Golden Goblins are back and consist of five tag events for the player to take part in. I'm not going to go over the mechanics of the goblin fights again but it's worth noting that you can bring your party along this time, making it substantially easier. This volume also marks your final set of Grunties to obtain. Players can get the obvious Noble Grunty that appears in every server, as well as the Rocker Grunty and the Woody Grunty. Once all three are obtained, another flag race is unlocked for Omega Server. Should the player complete this and get first place, as well as first place in all other servers, they get a bonus wallpaper. Early into quarantine, there is an item completion event that is mentioned, but ultimately cancelled. Players are expected to obtain and show off around 600 items in order to receive a prize. The event may be cancelled but is brought back within the post game and can be completed. However, it's awful and ultimately not worth it. Players must show a specific event and PC within any server the items they have on hand. They have to be in your inventory or your storage area in order to be marked off. This even includes things like virus cores for some reason. This is grueling for a few reasons, but namely because your storage area and inventory aren't able to house that many unique items, meaning you have to discard items to make room for new ones. To further kick you while you're down, the events only reward you with an image for your desktop, I'm pretty sure, making it ultimately one of the worst events and rewards within the game's entirety. I cannot express how useless this event is unless you are trying to create a perfect 100% save file. The event alone will take you hours upon hours of grinding and backtracking anyway, it's, it's just not worth it. Alright, so some final thoughts. Dot Hack is an amazing, long-running series, one that many may consider dead by this point, but to me has managed to grasp onto life despite its irrelevance in the modern day gaming market. That's thanks to a lot of things, mostly due to such a dedicated fanbase as well as the developers truly loving the series overall. CC2 is known to be big fans of their own work when it comes to Dot Hack. Unfortunately, Bandai Namco most likely doesn't see any financial incentive in keeping the series alive considering how niche the fanbase is. Despite this, we did see GU at the very least get remastered and even come with additional content. Many ask for and often wonder if we will see the same kind of remaster for IMOQ. While I would be all for it, I do feel that anybody new to the series that would try it would ultimately have a bad time. As good as the aesthetic of Dot .hack is, the gameplay within IMOQ specifically is so archaic and abysmal by this point that it would be incredibly tough to swallow. That doesn't mean it's impossible possible, however. Like how GU added some new features, IMOQ could potentially do the same in the form of quality of life. The multiplayer PS2 entry fragment was built off of the same engine and framework, while also adding in things like skill shortcuts so you didn't have to go into your menu every time you wanted to do an attack. Seeing something like that plus additional changes brought over into IMOQ could make it a much more enjoyable experience for a newer player base. I really enjoyed making this series, it's a passion project of mine born out of the love of Dot .hack and it's ever evolving and expanding narrative. I've loved these games, anime, manga, and light novels for as long as I can remember, and I hope these videos give you a reason to try the games out for yourself if you have the means to. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, it only takes a couple of seconds and helps support me in my goal of creating this content for you all. I'll try to respond to every comment I can, so if you want to hear from me, be sure to let me know. Additionally, you can find me on Twitch, often playing 
through Monster Hunter Challenge runs and discussing various topics. I hope to see you stop by. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. This is just a collection of previous Dot Hack History videos that I spliced together to uh, do a re-release of, but I do appreciate you watching it. Uh, we're now in the Patreon section of the video where I go ahead and shout out everyone that's a G-rank patron over on Patreon. So if you want to support the channel, you can do so. Uh, high tier people show up here. They show up right here and uh, G-rank people get vocally shouted out. So thank you to Frank Santorelli, uh, Wooly, Ralkar, Prime XD, Ashtray, Moal Kasemi, Captain Zeba, Cyberworm, Jonathan, Strange Lee, Lude Hafumi, Rosalio, and Mr. Janky. Thanks so much, and uh, shout out to Redbird who appears in the second part of this video. Uh, go check out their channel. Awesome videos. They just did one on AzumiCon, which is really, really interesting, and I watched the whole thing, so check that out too. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh -huh.